thank you very much for coming. Uh, I, my microphone seems to be working, very good. Um, before I start, uh, I would like actually to refer back to last year's debate between myself and Colin Blakemore. Could you please raise your hand if you were here for that debate, if you attended? Or if you saw it online afterwards? Okay, not very many people, all right. Um, could you raise your hand if you voted in favor of my position at the debate? Okay, and if you voted in favor of Colin's position? That's very good news, all right. That gives me a, um, that gives me a feel for the, uh, the spectrum of the audience, I suppose, even though the sample size is relatively a minority of the audience. Um, what I'm going to do is for about five minutes, followed by about ten minutes of Richard, we're going to talk a little bit about where we agree about the, uh, the, this field and why we think that Colin is a very dangerous man and uh, indeed why we think that anyone who agrees with Colin is very dangerous. Um, this is essentially what we're going to be talking about. First of all, a lot, of, a lot more points of agreement than you might normally see in a debate. Um, and perhaps some points of where well, we might agree or might not. And then we will have a vigorous debate about some things we don't agree on. But as you will see, those things do not exactly refer to either the feasibility of combating aging with medicine or the desirability. They um, refer to the particular methods that may or may not be the most promising for defeating aging and also how we ought to communicate this to the public. So, uh, these are the things we agree about, and we agree about so much that I'm afraid the font is rather small. Um, first of all, we agree that intervening in the aging process, in other words, postponing the ill health of old age to an older age than it naturally occurs at, is a morally desirable goal. And in fact, that anyone who fails to recognize this, even though there are lots and lots of you out there, is just making a mistake. That this is philosophically, and you know, it's just fallacious. Furthermore, we agree that there is a good chance of doing something in that direction, of postponing the ill health of old age. We believe that the aging process is malleable, and therefore that it's a valid research theme, a research goal, to try to do medical research in this space. Uh, we, we believe that partly because of results that have already been obtained in the laboratory. And this actually alludes to something that, as you will see later on, Richard and I do actually somewhat disagree about. But nevertheless, the general point here that we have seen progress in postponing aging in the laboratory does give reason for confidence that one or another way we will actually achieve the same thing in the clinic in due course. Finally, what this all adds up to is that research into the biology of aging, into actually finding out enough about aging to do something about it and then trying to do something about it is a vitally necessary research activity and therefore that it is grossly underfunded and we'll talk about exactly how underfunded in due course. So, you know, Richard wrote this slide and he described it in a very, um, you know, um, self-parodying British way as a strange view to hold. Um, uh, but we are going to convince you that even if you have some doubts about this right now, that it is actually the right view to hold. Uh, you may currently think we're both wrong, but we're going to fix that. So I'm going to actually elaborate on that a little bit more by reference to an interview that I did um, that was published on the BBC website not long ago, a few years ago. Uh, Richard dug this up yesterday, and uh, it's actually quite a good thing to, to talk about at this point. And um, first of all, do note the disclaimer on the left. I'm not yet getting on to the question of feasibility, of practicality. This is all for the moment about whether it would be a good thing to postpone aging, and in particular, whether it would be a good thing to postpone aging indefinitely. Um, so a journalist named Pascal Harter from The World Today um, chose to take exception to my view on this. Um, we're going to do a little double act now. Um, uh, in which Richard is going to play Pascal Harter. I don't know if he's going to be able to do the voice. Um, but anyway, uh, what we have here is um, something that I said during this exchange. I said, older people will not just look like young adults when they are beneficiaries of these therapies. They will actually feel and function like young adults in every way. And a lot of people listening might think that is a horrific idea. The cycle of life has certain benefits. It creates space in in a company for the new to come up and take their turn. 
And I said, it's certainly the case that the elimination of ageing would bring about an enormous number of changes in society, but that is not a reason not to do it. So essentially what this means is that this, this lady, Pascal Harter's ethical stance is that on the one hand, the elimination of late life disease and morbidity is a horrific idea, but on the other hand, she's in favour of addressing arbitrarily well, you understand, the specific diseases of old age, such as Alzheimer's disease. If you go and look at the web, web page that I um, referenced earlier, you'll see that earlier on in the conversation she'd actually made this statement. So what's going on here? How can someone be comfortable with killing older people in order to allow younger people to be in charge when one's also in favour of keeping people alive by helping them not to have the diseases they get? Is she in a state of ethical contradiction in some way? And if she is, does she even know it? So let's actually look at a somewhat similar but subtly different version of the conversation that actually occurred. Here it goes. Supposing we have therapies that really, really cure cancer, and we apply them on people, and I say, people who used to have cancer will not just look like healthy people, they will function like healthy people in every way. A lot of people listening might think that is a horrific idea. <laughs> cancer has certain benefits. It creates space in a company for the new to come up and take their turn. <laughs> it's certainly the case that elimination of cancer would bring about an enormous number of changes in society. It would be very hard to keep a job as an oncologist. But, uh, uh, but that's not a reason not to do it. So, you know, it's a bit of a weird thing here. All I'm saying is, hello, you know, ageing causes suffering and death. It kills people. Uh, suffering and death are generally considered to be not a good thing. Therefore, the removal of any cause of suffering and death, especially the one that causes more suffering and death than anything else in the entire world, which, of course, ageing is, is thus a moral imperative. And ethically, so this is obviously an ethically coherent, factually accurate approach. Now... This woman, Pascal Harter, said, the natural cycle of life suggests that ageing is a good thing because ageing is a natural thing. Uh, whereas, in some ways, she feels that diseases are not natural and therefore it's okay to think that diseases are bad. This is what often has been called the naturalistic fallacy. And unfortunately, the naturalistic fallacy is actually a bit of a fallacy, to be perfectly honest. Here is um, a spectrum of things that demonstrate rather clearly how fallacious the naturalistic fallacy is. We have on the top row a bunch of not terribly good things that are natural, tsunamis, volcanoes, the Black Death. And on the bottom, we have a number of completely unnatural things, products of technology, which, of course, by definition is unnatural, and which we seem to rather approve of, you know, umbrellas and houses and books. And, you know, it, 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 it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to see that this is, um, this is how things are. So now I'll move on to Richard, who will talk about other stuff. Hopefully. Is my mic on? Yes, OK. It falls to me to do the controversial stuff, OK? I have to tell you that ageing can sometimes be quite bad, okay? And the reason I say this is because sometimes when you talk about human ageing, people get very upset if you say that ageing is quite bad for many people most of the time. So I thought I'd pick on horses for two reasons. One, I like horses, and two, it gives me a chance to show off my mate's really cool fly mask. So if you, score, if you ignore people and concentrate on old racehorses, about 10% of them are too fat, about 15% of them are too thin. About 80% of them are, have a gammy leg. All of them have a dodgy joint. 39% show abnormal molting. And speaking as somebody who shows abnormal molting, I feel this is a greatly under-researched area. Okay? All of them have problems seeing where they're going, and most of them have problems seeing what they're eating or indeed eating it. Okay? And if we move from one set of animals that I care about a lot to another set of animals that I care about a lot, you'll see the problem. This is data kindly supplied to me by Tom Kirkwood from the Newcastle 85 Plus study. What we have here is just the fraction of a population over the age of 85 who have any number of 15 common physiological impairments, age-related chronic diseases. Virtually no one is disease-free at the age of 85, but the goal of our research, ideally, would be that everybody was as disease-free as we could make them for as long as we could make them. And we are a long way from achieving that. The average 85-year-old will be carrying around between four and six 
chronic conditions that compromise their independence, that reduce their quality of life. And quality of life is the goal of ageing research. But, okay, lots of things go wrong. Is there such a thing as an ageing process? And this is a mildly infamous article that appeared in the BMJ many years ago with the strap line, there is no such thing as ageing, written by the famous epidemiologist Richard Doll. He's the guy on the left. As you can see, he is not undergoing ageing at the age of 85. And the article contains some confusion, some contradictions, some very good science, but it also contains this quote. The fact that lots of adult diseases tend to arise in some part of the lifespan is not good evidence that they have similar underlying mechanisms, nor is it good evidence that a single unifying change awaits discovery that could properly be called ageing. What is he thinking? Probably something like this. That you start off healthy and you just happen to be young. And you end up sick and you just happen to be old. And you start off without cardiovascular disease. There's a process of insults or exposure. You get it. You start off without cancer. There's a different process. You get it. Start off without AD, a different process, Parkinson's, etc., etc., and ad infinitum. This is the way that disease-specific research is currently structured. It is also the way communicable disease research is structured, and for very good reasons. There really are different causes for different conditions. Okay. Is this an example of no fool like an old fool? No, it's not. Doll's argument is a perfectly reasonable example of deduction a priori from the epidemiological data. And Richard Doll is nothing if not one of the world's great epidemiologists. Perfectly reasonable in 1967. By 1997, at least in my view, it was essentially untenable and had been so for a while. It has a strong prediction that if every disease has a distinct cause, then a single change should not be able to cure multiple diseases because they're parallel track. Unfortunately, has it gone? Oh, it did that beautifully. There we go. Unfortunately, from the 80s onwards, with the pioneering work of Michael Klass, it became possible to isolate single gene mutations, first of all in C. elegans, subsequently in Drosophila and in mice, which show greatly extended healthy lives. The reason that they show extended healthy lives is that they are much healthier. They are extended health span mutants, so far as we can tell. This is an area that is ripe for more research, but all of the data is consistent with this. They live longer because their all disease mortality is reduced. I couldn't come to Oxford without showing an insanely complicated diagram, giving you five minutes to copy it down or less and then setting it on an exam in three years' time. So most mutants are in the IIS pathway, They're sing and you might turn around and say, oh, well, they're mutant animals, who cares? Then came this. This is rapamycin. It works here in the pathway with the big red cross across it. And it has a very interesting effect, which is if you administer this to animals, even in mid to late life, you see a significant extension of their lifespan. However, there are more than a few straws in the wind here that show we are not lengthening life. We are lengthening life through the improvement of health. We are improving health span, we hope. Again, this science is a progress report, nothing more, a subject to which I shall return. And it's not the only game in town, okay? There are also mutants which accelerate aging. This is Werner's syndrome. In case any of you are wondering, the guy on the right is the guy with Werner's syndrome. The guy on the left just has a weight problem and a tie that was absolutely state of the art in 1989 and has yet to return to fashion. Okay. At least in my scientific opinion, my group works on Werner's, the most likely cause of this terrible disease is the accelerated accumulation of senescent cells. There are people who will give you an argument on that, which is matter for another day. However, there, are at least some, there is at least some evidence in the scientific literature now that the deletion of senescent cells will also improve health span, which is a positive thought. And so, just to summarize the scientific section, the fundamental biology of aging probably doesn't look like this. It probably looks like this, where you have a few mechanisms, and I'll call them aging mechanisms, 
that cause, when acting together, the things we think of as the diseases of ageing. I've put that in quotes as well. And it is these that cause the morbidity, the loss of independence that we are trying to target. And this is an incredibly hopeful slide because it offers the potential for a broad-spectrum preventative medicine, a preventative geriatrics, if you will, which would target multiple late-life pathologies and impairments. It offers hope. It does not offer tablets. Okay? And I will move through now to the funding situation. It's amazing, isn't it, how science fiction and science fact can sometimes collide. In the 1960s, John Wyndham wrote this book, The Trouble with Lichen, in which an antibiotic which dramatically slows the aging process is isolated from a rare fungus. Well, we've got that now. We've got the name wrong. Okay, society then convulses, none of which you appear to be doing, as it tries to deal with the consequences. It must have been great to have been alive in Wyndham's time. I love the quote. I can't work out if he's parodying Winston Churchill or Jim Hacker or both. But it's just, you know, and Jerome was a British triumph. You need have no doubt, you know, the government therefore proposes an immediate grant of 10 million pounds to subsidize research. You need have no doubt that British brains, British purpose, and British know-how will succeed in the very near future. A dubious thing at the best of times. But if you're interested, the, count, the Research Council's grant at the time Wyndham wrote this was less than £20 million. It's quite a substantial budget hike, and it hasn't occurred. And that is where fiction and fact diverge pretty sharply. If you're interested, these are rough figures because I have better things to do than to appraise them, reappraise them week by week. That's the national budget. That is the NHS cost. It's the single largest item on the budget. That is the Oxford Institute of Research's best estimate for the costs of ageing to the NHS. That is the science budget down there. That looks like a thick line. And those of you with exceptional eyesight who can divide that line by several hundred will encounter the ageing budget. And all I'm trying to say is that the field is not swimming in money here. Okay? And if anything that was done in any of the mainstream labs could impact morbidity by a fraction of 1%, we would not just pay for ageing research. We would pay for a large chunk of human endeavour as is captured in universities. And there are some economic arguments underlying this. There's a rather nice study from the Rand Corporation on what are the, the economic implications of anti-aging medicines. A compound capable of adding healthy years to life expectancy is by far the most effective intervention that we have. The Rand calculated that using this, you could buy an an extra life year for about $8,000. The next most effective intervention would be a drug which cut Alzheimer's incidence, where you buy an extra life year for about $80,000. It's much more efficient, and there are signs that targeting the fundamental mechanisms of aging would be a successful strategy. What that successful strategy is, is where we differ pretty sharply. Over to you, Aubrey.